Goblins, and welcome back to Bride of Alternate Ending. My name is Brennan Klein. I'm here, as always, with Tim Brayton. How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing so good, Brennan. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing rather well. Um, no explanation. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm on and up right now, so I'm just going to embrace it. I'm glad to hear. Sounds like, sounds like you got yourself some cocaine. I love it. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Uh, not to derail this episode immediately, but I am watching through Beverly Hills 90210 for the first time. And uh, okay. I just got to the episode where Kelly Taylor's mom is just bumping rails in the school bathroom before a fashion show. It is it's great stuff. Anyway. I I have seen not more than two minutes of that program, but I, I am glad that it holds up. Oh, it does it it holds something. <laughs> um I just, you know, I just needed a dose of 90s hunkiness, and that, that was just, it was available that, to that me. Is, that is the level on which it was going to hold up, to be clear. I'm not saying, I'm pleased that this cornerstone of quality television remains quality. That's not what I wanted to imply oh, no. with my, my statement about it holding up. Not at all. Also, no, you know what? This is not, oh, moving on. We are here to talk about today um, a movie that was voted by our Patreons. Our theme this month is going to be films... Like, we're, we're digging out the horror or horror-adjacent films out of the closets of people who are nominated for Oscars this year. And the Patreon folks voted for this particular film. It's a Steven Spielberg joint, 2005's War of the Worlds. Yes, famous skeleton in the closet, very little-known film that made $613 million at the international box office. Yes, it, it, it did all that, and yet, when's the last time you heard anyone talk about it? You know, I I was pondering this as I was watching it, that I I feel like, in a weird way, this film has has just completely fallen out of the conversation. Even really compared to his other film from 2005, uh, Munich, which I don't think people... It's not like anyone's go-to Steven Spielberg film was like, oh, you mean the director of Munich? But, like, that's still... People, like, have it as a reference point. And I feel like people don't have War of the Worlds as a reference point. And that's... Shocking to me for a Steven Spielberg alien invasion movie that made over five hundred million dollars and stars Tom Cruise. Yeah, and, and especially shocking because if I recall correctly, the the giant set of the downed plane is at Universal Studios in in Hollywood as part of their tram tour. It's it's it, but it's just like they just keep reusing it for other things, and I don't think they even talk about where it came from anymore. I mean, downed planes, you have them in movies. It's nice to have a standing down plane to, downed plane set. Yeah. Um, when was the last time you saw this movie? Uh, the last time I saw this movie would have probably been in 2011 or 2012, so about 10 years. Okay, and so, and then, and that is the freshest of the two of us, because I haven't seen it since theaters. Wow. Um, and I was... And you were like six. I was 11 when, when this okay. movie came out. <laughs> Um, so I did not have my critical thinking cap on yet. It hadn't come in the mail. Um, I don't remember what I thought of this movie in theaters, but I, I remember seeing it and the, the scenes that lived in my brain for longer are mainly from the third act, which is one of the weaker parts of the movie. So that was interesting to me. (laughs) I, I find multiple things I want to immediately respond to what you just said amongst them being your your heinous and fallacious claim that the third act is the weak part of the movie. But I mean, but we'll get there. Some, I, I uh, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm not talking about the Tim Robbins stuff, although I remembered him too. Um, I mainly remember the like alien tentacle beast thing. That's like sucking up people into the tripod. See, I like that part a lot. Yeah, I don't, We'll get there. 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 That's, that's, that's at the far end of the movie. We have so much movie to traverse before we get to, uh, to the third third act or or potentially the fourth act i would actually say this is a very very clear-cut four act structure sort of movie Mm -hmm. but okay so let's start with probably an important question and and one that the choice of this movie kind of sparked on the discord do you consider war of the worlds to be to touch the horror genre in any meaningful way 
I think it touches the horror genre in any meaningful way. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, do I think it is a horror film? I do not think it is a horror film, but I think it is a film that traffics successfully in horror imagery. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And it, it is a film, unlike, let's say, um, Jurassic Park, which is another Steven Spielberg film that touches on a lot of horror elements um, and has horror sequences. Um, Jurassic Park is very much still a, a, a whiz-bang, technical, popcorn-munching movie. And this movie is grueling. It It is... I, I mentioned this in my letterbox review of the film from this rewatching. Uh... It is tempting for me to call this the last great Steven Spielberg popcorn film. It is also hard to call this a popcorn film at all. Because it is such a just punishing ride. Yeah, it, it, it it's really living in this weird existential space. Um, I also... I mean, look, my idea, my concept of what the horror genre is... My doors are wide open just because I want to be able to, you know kind of cover anything on among in the horror spaces that I usually write and podcast within. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't necessarily say this was a horror m- movie uh, in and of itself. Let's put, let's put it this way. If I had a full review on the site, and I don't, I should, but if I had a full review on the site, I would put the horror tag on this movie. Okay. Well, that's important. As I, as I believe I put the horror tag on Jaws, and I believe I... I don't know if I put it on Jurassic Park or not. Okay. Well, I would say, to me, Jaws, the primary genre of Jaws is horror. Um, But the primary genre of this, I would say, like, it is as much a horror film as any particularly harrowing disaster movie is a horror film. <clears throat> as much as, I mean, we had, um, on one of our previous polls, we had Day of the Triffids on there. Like, mm. this is as much a horror film as that type of yes apocalyptic agreed. science fiction film. agreed that's a good that's a very good point of comparison um yeah no i i, I have nothing to add to that i just i, I agree but uh it did see, seem like you were going to take this in a direction so no, no no um well let's just start with the plot i mean you know it's hg wells's war of the worlds perhaps it you've heard of it hg wells's war of the worlds yes it is uh it is the not more than third major major adaptation of this novel following uh the 1953 uh byron haskin directed version that was a very big effects movie at the time it won a special academy award for its visual effects and then previous to that a a legendary infamous even uh 1938 radio broadcast on halloween night by uh, orson welles and his mercury theater of the air yeah, absolutely. I, I I was telling my boyfriend Ben about the story of that, and it was blowing his mind. Um, but yes, so which which not not that I want to go go too far down the rabbit hole of a different or of the worlds. Uh, the degree to which people were actually running in terror and rioting and what have you because of Orson Welles' radio broadcast has has certainly been overstated as part of the mythology of Orson Welles and the mythology of, of like the great radio dramas and their, mm. their waning days. But uh, it certainly got people good and, and freaked out. That one is horror. Like the Orson Welles version is by any conceivable definition, a work of horror storytelling. So, so it's something in this, in this project's DNA for sure. Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah. Well, it, it's the, it's about the, just the, the sheer scale and, impotence of humanity in the face of this you know horrible fate it, it, it it's mm-hmm. i mean it follows is kind of about the same thing yeah I um or i mean almost any horror thing is just about the infinite uh right. impending doom of death exactly like like death is coming and you can't stop it yeah um but a- anyway the the in this particular case death is coming to tom cruise um, Wikipedia described him as playing the title role, so he's playing uh, Mr. War. He's, he's, oh, the world. Say, he's, he's playing playing John Q. War, one of my favorite characters in his, <laughs> yeah. his career. Mm-hmm. Um, no, yeah, he's playing Ray Farrier. A <laughs> how how great would it be though if instead of Farrier, the family surname was World. He was Ray World. Ooh. And this was War of the Worlds. 
Yeah, and and then that it, that would make it much more about his divorce too. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes, he is divorced from Miranda Otto, who's in two scenes of this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. and despite that, is the third credited in the end credit scroll. Yeah, that's random. Like above, like both kids are much higher presences in than she is. And and I take that to be a child actor thing where they never get their full credit in terms of like hierarchies within the credits scroll. Okay. But. Well, did did she get wait uh I was just thinking th- this was not her first movie, right? Um No, this this is uh this is coming on the the back of the Lord of the Rings. So, so, I'm so sorry. I did not finish that sentence or did not start that sentence properly. This is not Dakota Fanning's first movie. Oh. Uh, no, it is certainly not. No, okay. So th- she wouldn't have gotten like introducing that would have shoved her later. It just they just weren't no, doing no. Things. She she had a uh, she had already been been by this point taken away from her her beloved father Sam in the classic <laughs> work of cinema. I am Sam. Oh, poor poor Dakota. Poor uh, Dakota. Yes, but speak- I think this is also post Man on Fire. So no, Dakota Fanning's an old hat. She's like, she's a she's a trooper at this point. Yeah, we're we're sick of her. Um. Anyway, so, yes, Tom Cruise is a, you know, blue-collar kind of dock worker guy. Um, mm, not not a, not giving a believable performance at this to me. I mean, I don't buy him as a blue-collar worker, but the film does not foreground that he is. I mean, it, it foregrounds it, like, in the, the text of the narrative emotionally my connection to the film and the character is not contingent on believing that he is a an automobile mechanic no but okay so, so here's for me for me the reason i don't flat out love this movie is tom cruise i think he is miscast in a lot of different ways um and this is just the first way that i am it, it, it's just it's the first uh ping on my radar of oh, i'm not I'm not getting what i need from this man in this particular film See, I I do fully love this movie, and I won't say Tom Cruise is one of the reasons why, but I would say that the only significant ding against him for me is is that I I don't. It's hard for me to visualize him covered in grease under the hood of a car. Yes, uh, but I'd, I'd say that is that is where I would end my complaints about his performance. Okay, well we'll we'll, we'll get back we'll to get that as too. well. We'll um, get back to that. But yes, he is a divorced father of two. He is not plugged in he is very much a a layabout dad um he is foisted upon with his two children his young daughter rachel and his teen son robbie played by justin chatwin and and the first thing we learn about this character is that he is so late to pick his children up that his ex-wife clearly assumes he has died along the way to get there (laughs) yes um yeah he's late to pick them up he's has no interest in feeding them just assumes they can fend for themselves. He plays a very angry game of catch with Justin Chatwin. I taught that scene in my editing class that I used to have. I, I inherited it from the previous teacher of that class, but it's a good, good scene to uh, to talk about escalating anger between two characters. Because it starts out, he's like, oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to play catch with my son. And it, it turns into this like harsh, crisp, like accelerated series of balls being thrown in the face yeah it's it, it that's a it's a really good way to attach li- you know motion to emotion mm-hmm. um that is a really good scene and uh also i forgot morgan freeman narrated this movie morgan freeman narrated this movie it's steven spielberg in in 2005 spending what was a shockingly large budget. I think it was the highest amount of money ever greenlit. Certainly did not end up becoming the most expensive movie ever made, but it was the the highest, like, approved budget, I believe. And half of it went to Morgan Freeman? uh, Well, I was going to say, so Steven Spielberg, you know, if he wants to grab Morgan Freeman for six lines, three at the beginning and three at the end, he gets to do that. Was this... This would have been shortly before March of the Penguins, right? Uh, March of the Penguins was 2004. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're, we're, we're just writing on that. So yeah. So Mar- Morgan Freeman had already been in movies by this point. Yes. Well, um, but I, f- I feel like the thing of the joke of, oh, we should get Morgan Freeman to narrate that started with March of the Penguins. That I believe to be accurate. So remember that excruciatingly bad Mike Myers 
comedy about the you have to the, be more specific the the love guru oh god yep where it opens with a joke that he has a machine that he can speak into and it kicks out several different narration voices and one of them is morgan freeman and they they paid morgan freeman to be the butt of that joke i mean if you got paid to be the butt of a joke in a hollywood movie would you do it even if it was mike myers i mean maybe it's good enough for morgan freeman yeah look i gotta pay my rent we all do exactly um anyway so yeah basically you know we have he's here with his kids and then the aliens arrive and then the aliens uh the the there is initially some faint towards what's going on there's lightning and there's wind blowing the wrong way and the birds are freaking out uh and and i do think i am undecided and i'd be curious what your opinion is here if the film pussyfoots around a little too much getting us to the first alien spaceship, given that the title of the film is War of the Worlds, and given that we might not know the the nuanced details of the H.G. Wells script or, or story, but I think everyone who sees that title and walks into that theater gets that it's an alien invasion film. Hmm. So does it, does it take too long to ramp up for you? I... Mm, I think... There's at least one specific scene that's a little too long, but I don't think so. I think, I, I do think it's all just part of this slow escalation of dread and the the increasing threat of what's going on. Like, I don't think we're meant to not know what's happening. Like, they, everyone, they're, they're doing that early in a disaster movie thing where they keep clicking past news reports of, like, unexplained lightning across the world, EMPs, things going down. And you're like, yeah, it's aliens. Um yep. But I would say the the scene where Tom Cruise keeps running to different locations to <clears throat> poke things with his finger and say, well, this is weird, um, that goes on a little too long. That is the specific theme scene I was thinking of when I asked that question. Because I, I do think um, it's like 25 minutes when we see the first spaceship. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe Steven Spielberg to be one of the absolute greatest filmmakers who has ever lived at, at pacing his movies. Like I think he's just really good at making films clip by so that you're shocked when they're, when they're over. And I was shocked that it was 25 minutes. I was like, Holy shit, this is we're a quarter of the way through this movie and we're only just not getting to the plot. Um, so that's part of, part of where the question came from. It's just like, wow, that was 25 minutes. I don't feel the length except for that Mm -hmm. scene you've just mentioned. Yeah, no, that, and that's the moment where it's just, and also he's just being an idiot, like just like, oh, maybe I'll lick this, or you know, it's just, it's just really <laughs> strange decisions. Yeah. Um, but no, I like I. Other than that, I would like you know, I wouldn't cut the scene of you know the, the wind blowing backwards and all the all the hanging sheets that are necessarily on a clothesline in the back, like getting kind of sucked towards the, uh, mm-hmm. the the center of this. Although I will say another slightly unbelievable thing, I do not believe that. T- this Tom Cruise character has sheets hanging in his backyard. I, I believe it ish. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that a, a single father who clearly doesn't give a shit about anything is hanging his sheets out to dry. But I also believe that this Tom Cruise character broke his dryer six years ago and has never gotten around to fixing it. No, I get that, but I don't think this man washes his sheets. Ah, that that, yes, I can see that. Like once they once they get too dirty, he just buys new ones and throws out the old <laughs> ones. <laughs> that seems plausible. Mm-hmm. Yes, I but that's a character. Yeah, but of course, visually, like that's a really stunning moment. Um, and I really like the the big like the that big set piece of the 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 cracks in the foundation of the city making this giant circle so the you know the tribe the alien tripod can emerge oh man so good it's so good and also of course the the whole thing of like the first major building to topple is a church where it's like your god can't help you now mhm which is which is very pointed and again steven spielberg is is a populist he he goes for when when there is subtle imagery he could sneak into his movies, he would much prefer to go for the big honking imagery, you know? Oh yeah. And I love that instinct. And also the Absolutely. The light shining through the like the stained glass window in the nave of the church. It's it's a gorgeous shot and you know, mm-hmm. I just I, I think it it ranks among some of his best shots. Like I he I the way he uses 
that bombastic imagery is always so potent. Mm-hmm. And and to that end, I want to mention before we get too far into it, and I forget to do so. Uh, this is as every Spielberg film is, so this is not a big deal. This was shot by Janusz Kaminski, uh, who I I think I am not alone amongst lovers of Spielberg and even lovers of Kaminsky for that matter in feeling that they have gotten out of each other everything they're going to get here in the year of our Lord 2022 um I would say for example I feel like West Side Story was very nearly Kaminsky doing a parody of himself so so it's easy to be like post Lincoln and post, you know, whatever Indiana Jones four. Post the and post. Just be like, post the post, and just be like, Ugh. like why don't they just? They need to start seeing other people. <laughs> but I do think War of the Worlds is for me maybe the last time that Kaminsky was trying something new in a Spielberg film, and I think the church scene is actually not one of the places he's trying something new. I mm-hmm. think that's one of his like more characteristic scenes in fact in terms of like where the light's coming from and how the the beams of light are working but i think that's part of what what is cool about it is it's like in sort of the same way that the the text of the moment is god can't save you uh which is ironic given where the film goes um visually i feel like it's sort of spielberg and kaminsky renouncing that style it's like they're 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 killing it with the church in a way Oh, that that's a really interesting point because yeah, it, it does become it becomes more of an on the ground harrowing kind of you know yeah. war lot, war movie. A lot of handheld camera, so much handheld camera in this movie. Uh, I don't remember what they did. I knew this back in two thousand five, but they get this very distinct, like bleached out, overly white look. I'm not sure if they flashed the film. I'm not sure exactly what they did, but uh, it's a it's a very like like ashen looking film like it's just it's undersaturated in this really aggressive way it's grainy as hell it's such a grainy movie uh so it, it looks very different and i think very very cool and you know in, within this we're still getting beams of light we're still getting people wreathed in auras and, and all that spielbergy stuff but uh it's it's coming in the form of a i think i think a profoundly ugly in a, in a good way like a deliberately thoughtfully ugly film for a Spielberg film. Yeah, no, like like we said, it, because it, this is an exceptionally punishing film for the thing that he does. Um, like, it, it's taking so many Spielbergian tropes. Like, there's a lot of Jurassic Park in here. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. um, not to... I, I did read your Letterboxd review. Like, uh, it, <laughs> you, you mentioned that um, that scene of... We're going to spoil this movie. It's War of the Worlds. Um, it's War of the Worlds. Yeah, um, God saves them with the the cold virus. Everybody, yeah, the aliens die of the cold. Ta-da! Um, as foreshadowed by Tom Cruise coughing at one point in the first act. <laughs> well, it's it's foreshadowed by the opening scene that's oh, yeah. on a droplet of water, and it's like, why is there a droplet of water? And then it's like Morgan Freeman comes back and tells us it's because because disease lives in the water. Yeah, that was that was silly. I would I would have cut both of those things. I mean, part of the reason you adapt War of the Worlds is because you are willing to cope with they died of the cold. No, as no, the no. Film, as the plot's denouement. <laughs> well, no, the, that I'm not criticizing, but the fact that okay. the film opens on a little CGI bacterium okay. is is very silly. <laughs> I agree, but I think they needed to do something to set up that ending, and that's the best they could come up with. I guess. Um, I no, I think Tom Cruise should be sniffling and blowing his nose through this entire thing. Um, but, uh, uh, oh yeah, so that scene, uh, the, sorry, yes? I'm going to take that suggestion seriously and say that the issue I would have had with it is it would have implied that Tom Cruise single-handedly killed the aliens by being sick while he was fighting them, and and that would be over the top to me. Even though I feel like it would be within the wheelhouse of Tom Cruise as a movie character. Oh, absolutely. And also, he gets, he gets you know, because he gets that moment where he uh, sucks up some grenades into the innards of the ship. You know, yes. he just, yes. like, suck his own disease-ridden body in there and destroy the aliens. Yeah. Yeah. Just ha- ha- have a big old good booger just kind of spit it right up on the alien. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so, yeah, so the, 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 there's a lot of mimics of Jurassic Park, especially in that basement scene where they're hiding mm-hmm. from the uh, the abyss probe. <laughs> The the cobra type creature that is is sort of the aliens 
thing. Yes. Um, but also, especially Jurassic Park, uh, Dakota Fanning sees like notices that there are presences in the basement because the water flooding in the basement starts to ripple. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, there's a lot of these really tiny things. That, I mean, that's just what Spielberg is good at. Um, yep. one, oh, one, one moment of just like a really subtle, tiny <sighs> thing that I think really works to highlight the scale of what's going on is that early on when there's this giant cloud darkening the sky um, in the middle of the day, uh, the street lamps flick on because they think it's nighttime. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so there's these all these little things that remind you of how big everything is, and mm-hmm. I, I think that that's really... I, I really like that. No, it's... The interesting thing, you know, we, we've been talking a little bit here about, like, it's such a, an out-of-character Spielberg film because it's so heavy and gloomy and it's not a popcorn film and whatever. It's a Spielberg film. Mm-hmm. Like, you watch this, I think you immediately understand, okay, this is this is what he does. He is not operating outside of his stylistic wheelhouse, really. I mean, the cinematography looks weird, but the shots are Spielberg shots, the sense of scale is Spielberg the, the way that characters sort of go through their emotional arcs. Like, this is a Spielberg film. He is playing to his strengths. And I, I think he plays to his strengths very well with this film. Yes, and, and also the, the things that he's interested in down to uh, this kind of estranged father dynamic. Oh, yeah. Um, how do you think that works? How do you think that functions within this movie? Um, For me, I actually think this is one of the cases where I tend to view that theme throughout Spielberg almost not even as a crutch because I don't think he's like doing it purposefully I think it's just a tick it's like there's going to be a bad dad in the Spielberg movie that's how it goes there's going to be some some emotionally unavailable adult male who will over the course of the film thaw and become more emotionally available I mean you see this a billion times in, in Spielberg movies uh and I sometimes feel like it just kind of sits there because he's got weird obsessions I think because this film is very consciously built around that as its primary character arc, like that's that's Tom Cruise's journey. Mm-hmm. Will he sack up, become a good dad, do what needs to be done, sacrifice of himself to get his, his children to safety? Uh, I think it's one of the better applications of that theme in Spielberg's canon, honestly. I... And here's one of the the reasons where where I want to sort of drift away from you. You you mentioned earlier on that you think that the the film weakens as it goes. Uh, I like Once the Sun Leaves because I find Justin... Justin Chatwin? Chatwin. I was like, it's not Justin Kurzel. He's he's a very different Justin. Uh, Justin Chatwin. I find him to be an agitating screen presence. I don't think he's a bad actor. I just find him to be very, like, screamy in a way mm-hmm. that, that puts me on edge and not to the benefit of the film. So I, I don't mind when he leaves. And and he changes the, the father theme, because when it's about Tom Cruise and Dakota Fanning, it's different than when it's about Tom Cruise and Justin Chatwin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and Justin Chatwin, he, he does run out of value to the movie right at about the time that they kick him out, or <laughs> shortly before that. Um like, I think that there's an interesting dynamic in the sense of, like, early on when Tom Cruise has witnessed a lot of things and he's, like, driving away in a van with his kids and they don't know anything about what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, when the the son, Robbie, is like, tell me everything you know. Like, the, the way that he's trying to engage and kind of commanding his dad, who he knows is kind of useless and trying to mm-hmm. take charge of the situation. Like, I think that's an interesting dynamic. That's a good scene. Obviously, we've talked about the playing catch scene, which I think is, is terrific. Um... I think by the time they hit the mom's house, which is after the scene you described, but not long after it, yeah, that's where it feels like at this point we've seen every scene we're gonna get with, mm-hmm. with the Charlie. Is that right? Robbie, Robbie, yes. I am. It's not a character movie to me. Um, Robbie is is. I think we've gotten what we're gonna get out of him. Yeah, by, by the mom's house. No, because all of his subsequent scenes are just setting up that he wants to fight in the war of the worlds. Exactly. And it's just not that interesting to, to, to look at. No. Um, it's not. But, okay, ultimately, so, yes, we're, we're dealing with this very, honestly, very Roland Emmerich kind of style, divorced dad, disaster movie, mm-hmm. emotional arc. Um, 
and and obviously you know obviously the 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 dad situation comes from spielberg but it just the way it's married to the disaster thing if he had gotten back together with miranda otto at the end that would be an emmerich movie (laughs) yes um if he'd punched if he'd punched out tim and just like get planted a big kiss right in miranda otto and that's how the film ended yeah, and I'm so glad it doesn't. Even though we'll we'll get to the the ending ending of the movie. It, it it is the only correct choice made in the staging of the final yes finale of the film. Yes, um, but anyway, so I just I don't fully I just I don't for me Tom Cruise isn't working for me as that arc. He he works for me as someone to have a beautiful face and stare at horrible things that are really big. Um, but he's doing this charming movie star like i'm gonna smile tom cruise thing very frequently that just jars with everything else about the more like the the grittier less blockbuster side of the movie to me and you know i'm not going to to defend this as being like one of the great tom cruise performances it's we're not we're not in magnolia we're not in eyes wide shut spielberg is constitutionally not interested in in testing the limits of the Tom Cruise character, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, that being said, he works for me in the, in that arc. Like, I think there is Tom Cruise is very good. And we see this in the mission impossibles. We see this in, in a lot of his, his movies. He's very good at, at like stretching his face and looking anguished and like scream crying after people. And I think a lot of, of, he relies on that. Like he's, it's not a great piece of acting. He's, he's relying on his, his bag of tricks, but when he does that and he's doing that towards, towards his son walking off to, as you say, join the war of the worlds, or he does that any number of times when he's like freaking out over Dakota Fanning. Um, I, I buy that. Like, like he looks distraught to mm-hmm. me often enough that I, I find the distraught face lingers in my brain more than the movie star tooth grin okay lingers in my brain see i, I think i just I, I think to me it's just that it, it's challenging watching this like extremely high wattage you know capital m capital s movie star in this movie because i think you know a movie star should be the anchor to a movie that's this bombastic and huge um mm. but it, this movie is also like really doing a tightrope act between being that and and being the opposite and I don't find him to be the perfect bridge between those two things. And that's legit. I, and I, I will I will say only a couple of things to, to, not to try to persuade you, because I, I don't uh-huh. think I shall and I don't think I'd want to, uh, just to sort of clarify where, where my feelings on it land. Um, you know, you say we would expect sort of the, the movie star to anchor this kind of bombast, and, and I think we would, and I think to an extent the fact that it doesn't is part of what makes the movie work. Uh, there There's a, a term... That I don't think has ever really like entered vogue. I don't think people talk about this like a cycle, but uh, post-human blockbuster movies, hmm. uh, which I first really encountered around the release of the 2014 Godzilla, but a a a branch of sort of pop art like big movies. Not, like, we're not talking about like little little character indies where this might actually be something they could work with extensively, but a branch of popcorn movies where the scope of the thing that is like the source of the spectacle and the source of the awe and and terror and what have you is so far beyond what humans can like deal with that the characters kind of get reduced to just these little like pegs being marched around. Mm -hmm. And I I think War of the Worlds is is one of the early pieces of that. Like we go into it being told, here's a Tom Cruise movie. You're going to watch, you know, awesome Tom Cruise being sexy movie star. Uh, And as the film progresses, he just... His Tom Cruise-ness is not equipped to deal with the the scope of mm. the hell raining down upon him. And okay. and I think it's probably crediting Spielberg and David Kep, and I forget who the other screenwriter is. I don't want to over-credit them and say that that was the point, mm-hmm. but I think it is a thing I take away from the film. No, that... The, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I just think that's really interesting. And also, because I did notice, especially during the scene of the crowds of people trying to get onto the ferry boat um, when the tripods show up, um, that feels very Battleship Potemkin. Like, it feels very, like, this is, the the protagonist is the people. It's not Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise. I completely agree. And even in the shots where Tom Cruise appears in that sequence, 
they're not using the tricks you use to make sure that we're looking at him. They're not overlighting him. They're not keeping him specifically in focus. Like he's just sort of swallowed up in the crowd in those sequences. Yeah, and so I, I, I can I can see where that fits into that, and I do I can get into that. And I think you're right, like Godzilla is doing a similar thing. I, I think I think Godzilla is is doing it the best of any film that has tried to do it, and it yeah. helps that Godzilla gives us as our only option for main character the just utterly flavorless Aaron, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Aaron T- Taylor Johnson, uh, and and who wants him to be the protagonist of a movie? Certainly the, that movie. So I think it's sort of it's easier to like dismiss the human element there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the other thing I did want to say about about. And again, this is not Kubrick. This is not Paul Thomas Anderson. Like, they're not weaponizing Tom Cruise's movie stardom. Mm -hmm. But I do think all the times in this movie that he most clearly is trying to do the, like, flash a grin, be a cute, cocky, like, I'm so clever and and hip and cute thing that Tom Cruise does, it's generally to impress his kids. And the son Mm -hmm. generally says, fuck you, I don't buy that shit anymore. So to an Mm -hmm. extent... Dead, I do think the movie is like showing that the Tom Cruise charisma is is facile. Okay, I I I can I I I both to an extent. Yeah, I both agree with you and remain unmoved by his role in the movie for the most part. Um, right. But I don't think it is completely film damaging. It's like I knocked off half a star for it, but I I don't think like I would watch this again and gladly you know see him do his thing and it's it's sure. not ruining anything this movie is sure. doing so much that isn't that and also dakota fanning is so fucking good in this movie dakota fanning is good i i'm not sure if i would call this her best performance but it's certainly in that conversation what would you say is her best performance oh she had she had some good shit mm-hmm. in the mid-2000s um i think sort of contrary to this film where there's so much going on that I don't think any one performance does or doesn't damage it. Mm -hmm. I think man on fire flat out does not work if she's not very good. Okay. I've not seen that. I might, I might be tempted to say that. Uh, it's, it's a movie that has lots of things that, that don't sit right with me, but I also love it's Tony Scottness. Okay. And, and sort of all of the emotional arc of that film is packed into Dakota Fanning's performance working or not. And it does. Do okay. I, I will have to watch that at some point. It's on my long, 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 long list for movies. Um, but yeah, but Dakota Fanning in this movie, just when her giant baby eyes are just welling with tears, it, it mm-hmm. really, it is just so perfectly. It, it is. Go ahead. No, it just it, it it does make you want to protect her and make sure that everything happens okay for her, and that that's what you need. It is a perfect mix of director and talent because her thing was I am a child, so I have huge eyes and I will flare them like a a marmoset. And Spielberg's <laughs> thing is light people's faces to exaggerate them staring out at things. So it's like it's just like you have an eye actor and an eye director just like colliding their talents together to create these shots that are just like so dominated by just as you say her eyes just kind of welling up and it's like it's great and and they go back to it over and over they're shameless mm-hmm. about doing this with her performance uh, but works so why not be you know this is a Spielberg film we're not expecting subtlety we're not expecting grace we're expecting it to like be a big tub thumping populist you know thing and i think it gets there very very well with those with those shots of dakota yeah it does like what is effective is still effective whether or not it's subtle like subtlety exactly yeah is should not always be the goal which which to me it's effective but not subtle is the the one line summary of steven spielberg's overarching career oh yeah um and look and I do not mind that every other shot of her is just her looking like the poster for Les Miserables. Like it is, <laughs> it is a great, a great, great thing to have as the emotional anchor for the movie. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, and, and yeah. even within that, like, I mean, we're talking about her, like she's a, a meat prop. She's giving a good performance. Yeah. She's actually, she's giving, I think technically the most controlled performance in this film, which is a fucking weird thing to say. Cause she was like seven or eight or whatever. Older than that, she's probably eleven by this point. But um, like, like the basement scene's a great example. You know, she's doing the Spielberg esque like character notices something 
cut to what they're noticing, cut back to like give us the emotional cue. She's like really managing that very well. She's letting us see exactly how scary it is, which isn't all the way scary. You know, it's it's like, hmm, I see water rippling. And, uh-huh. and like and she she lets that build up. She's like very good at sort of the mechanics of letting us see the terror grow rather than just like it's scary, you know? Yeah, like th- this this child is constantly a- shifting the degree to which she's reacting to what's going on around her. Yep. And it it's it's really really it's just it's good stuff. It's good um, stuff. Yeah, and and I would say th- this movie lives and dies on her performance more than anything uh, of the humans in this movie. She is the one responsible for making it a success. I I would agree, and I I wouldn't say lives or dies on her performance. In okay, well, that, that's the, I, yeah. I think, I think because she gives the best performance, it feels like she is what makes it work. But I feel like if instead Cruz had given the best performance, he would be what makes it feel like it it works. You know, I, I don't think that's inherent to the plot. I think it's just it worked out that way because she is giving the best performance. Yeah, maybe to rephrase, she is the thing that makes the smaller scenes the right. best. Right. Um, and, and like, yeah. there's that. There's there's before we really have a grapple on what's going on and the film is still trying to figure, you know, it's ratcheting up its tension. There's that scene in the car where she starts just screeching. Like her voice is like doing that uh-huh. thing that children's voices do where they almost feel like they're like vibrating in your ear. Uh, and that's a really good scene in terms mm-hmm. of like making me feel just absolutely on edge. And that's what it's doing. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's not like a secret. That's what that scene's trying to do. Um, but I think it does it well, and I think that given where we are in the arc of the film's tension rising, I think that, that scene comes at a great moment and does a really good work. Absolutely, yeah. It's like as far as films that weaponize that screeching, that, and then the scene in the Babadook where her son is kicking the back of her chair. Yeah, like it, yeah. it's on that level. Um, what speaking of the kind of emotional through line, I guess we should talk about the nine eleven of it all. There's a lot of 9-11 in this movie. This, honestly, this is going to sound ridiculous because the only thing anyone has ever talked about with War of the Worlds is that it's a 9-11 movie. There's more 9-11 than I remembered there being. Mm-hmm. Or at least more the state of culture circa 2004-2005. There's more of that than I recall. Yeah, I because obviously any sort of big destruction movie is going to have, in, in that time period, is going to have 9-11 yeah. flavors. But they, they do name drop terrorists at least twice in the movie. Right. That part I had recalled. And and I think oh, okay. it's it's important that they have the child be the character who says that. Because I think the difference between, okay, shut the fuck up about 9-11 and, ah, you are tapping into the sort of societal fear we now have is by making it sort of the boogeyman to a yeah. little girl. Like, if, if Tom Cruise is like, I bet it's the terrorists, it's like, just take it down, David yeah. Cap. You went too far. David Kemp or the other guy. I keep forgetting the other guy's name. To me, it's a David Kemp screenplay. I'll look it up. Um, but wait, so was well, there was something else uh, that stood out to you specifically? Well, well there's obviously the images. Right? Oh, of like course. The, the, the like, dust cloud and the like scraps of paper and cloth drifting down to the ground. Like That's that's straight up copying the news footage, you know? Yeah, and but, there's... I, I think you're talking about an early, early on shot, right? Because then there's a later one where there's like literally like, full articles of clothing just drifting through the sky mm-hmm. around Tom Cruise. No, I was thinking of the earlier one, but I think the later one is, is part of the same motif. I mm-hmm. think they're drawing on the same thing. Uh, but even beyond like those very overt nods to, to the nine 11 terrorist attack, there's just kind of like what's in the air right now that keeps happening. And I think it, it happens multiple times in the Tim Robbins scene uh, where he talks about, um, he says something about like an occupying force mm, yeah. and he talks about um, they beat the world's most powerful military in five minutes. And that, that sentiment has come up a couple other times, like people sort of being shell shocked that like America could so quickly be steamrolled. And I think there's a definite like post nine 11, Holy shit. American can be, America can be punched that hard. Mm. And there's the sort of weirdness of we went to war as quickly as we could in the first country that made itself available to go to war in and, and it quickly, quickly, quickly became clear, especially to someone on the political left as, as Spielberg is, um, that that war was going to, when it ended, end badly. And of course it didn't end for many, many years after this Mm -hmm. movie came out. But I I think this sense of like, 
the the narrative of America being enfeebled and and responding to that enfeeblement with like just kind of panic and not knowing what the hell was going on that is i think very much of that post 911 moment and i had forgotten that part of it mm-hmm. being in here like that sort of like sense of american impotence as a a through line in the film had had completely escaped my memory that's really interesting and and that's not something i picked up on not because it's not there but because i like i was dakota fanning's age during this time well, you're so, a son of a bitch, and I hope you get run over by a car on your way home uh, out of the house today. Oh, uh, thank you. Actually, I don't think I'm leaving. So, uh, well, well, can we? Well, can then, we then take I, a I hope an, I hope an airplane engine falls on your house. Great, today. thank you. Actually, I'm I'm only a couple blocks from where they the Donnie Darker house is. So okay, it, it, it's totally viable. <laughs> that that was fake for the movies, though. That wasn't real. I mean, the house is real. <laughs> The house, it, it, it wasn't like a plane fell in the house and they were like, ooh, we should shoot a movie here. They well, yeah, that. I know that. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I was that age. So, so that, yeah, that, that kind of idea, I, it was that kind of totemic, almost boogeyman mm-hmm. thing to me at the time more than, like, I, I didn't, I just, I still don't have the, I don't know, I just, I, bleh. anyway. The, the contextual of how the geopolitical conversation was and, going with it had missed me so i'm, I'm happy and, to have that and, context and that's the thing like like i still think about this when i when i look at my dear little students who are all you know born after 9 11 at this point like uh-huh. college students at this point are are have never existed in a pre-9-11 world let alone known one with their own like cognitive faculties uh and i think about this a lot because to me the the shift in every element of our culture surrounding that and those like three years from 2001 to 2004 um was it's it's the defining event really of my life i would say is seeing that happen and and feeling very very upset by what i was seeing happen uh but i think you you we don't get anything even close to that until the the currently waning down pandemic really Mm -hmm. um so i mean i that's that's something that i'm just like super sensitive towards that like where where were we culturally in the immediate wake like in the next five years after the 9-11 attacks uh so yeah so to me that's that's there um well i will i will put a pin in that because you know i i've said my bit um because you you did sort of you introduced this and, and i immediately took it away from you uh but to you what does the 9-11 of it all sort of do for you that's interesting um it's certainly not something I would have been thinking about when I was seeing it as a kid. Um, because I think I was at least, I mean, obviously I remember nine 11. I remember being, you know, really shocked by it and present for it and things like that. Like I was, yeah, but, but it didn't four years later, it hadn't stuck around in my brain in such a way that, you know, so, uh, like a blockbuster could evoke it mm-hmm. to me. Um, but also because I think I was protected from a lot of the images sure. of 9-11. I think, I mean, obviously I, I'd seen the basic situation, but a lot of, a lot of the fallout of it and a lot of the other angles on that, uh, event were not shown to me and I didn't discover those until a lot later. Hmm. Um, so when I was seeing it, I didn't make that connection. And obviously here I did. Um, but I don't know. I do feel a... I just I do feel an emotional disconnect from it, um, I, not not in the sense of, oh, it wasn't a sad thing or you know, but uh, but I just it it doesn't loom large in my life because it does feel like this fairy tale thing that happened when I was a kid. Sure. Um, so that is much less effective to evoke in a movie for me than uh, um, the you know just the the family dynamic. So I'm okay. But I don't know. That that's interesting because I I definitely, it's not that just because I wasn't around for something I can't be emotionally impacted by it. I am definitely emotionally impacted by like, the nuclear fears of the eighties that that are evoked in those films. Mm-hmm. Um, but for some reason, this particular thing, I and maybe because I was around but not but like really cushioned from it that it feels like this weird kind of wobbly limbo space for me i i like that because you mentioned you know the nuclear fear in the 1980s i was around for the 1980s but cushioned from them 
And to me, like, films about the 1980s fear of the Cold War are not remotely as compelling as, like, 60s films on the same subject. Maybe, like, so, like, yeah, maybe it like is what, that What Dr. Thing. Strangelove has to say about nuclear annihilation gets me a lot harder than what any 80s film does. So maybe it is just, like, if you were a child for it, but you were, like, an insulated, not-quite-there mentally child, maybe it just can't. I don't know. That's an interesting... I don't have... That's a a future research project, Yes, you might say. <laughs> But yeah, that'd be interesting to look into because I hadn't thought about it that way before. Um, Neither did I, yeah. I very much, like, I can definitely, and again, I can tap into stuff about, like, the 08 recession. Um, and I can tap into stuff that's, like, doing pandemic stuff now. I mean, you know, I'm emotionally available, but just that particular period is not really, doesn't live in me. No, interesting. I, I, I think there's something there that we are not going to unpack, but I'm glad that we tripped over this rock and I want to... I want to pick this rock up and put it in my pocket and carry it around with me for a little yeah. Um, but yeah, let, let, let's move on from that. To There's there's a little bit more to the 2005-ness of it all anyway. Um, I would say that the, the, the kind of headline of this would be terrorists and TiVo. Um, Man, the TiVo line just just cl- comes out. And, it, and that's another thing. I, I can put myself mentally in 2005 and be like, I get what that line is doing. I get all the work that that line is doing. But boy, hearing a character say, you should get a TiVo, Tim put one in my bedroom, is just like, that line clangs, and it's oh, not yeah. the line's fault. But boy, it's just like, whoa, yeah, and, that and, doesn't work. And an, another another way that that scene tries to talk about how, you know, Dakota Fanning's life at home is so much better than what her father can give her, is when he is disgusted to his core by the idea that people eat hummus. <laughs> right. I totally forgotten that. He's like, what and the he, fuck is this? And I don't think in 2005, I think we were eating hummus by 2005. I don't know. I was living in Chicago and it's, it's surrounding environment in 2005. Maybe I was just a hip urbanite, but like, I don't feel like hummus was... Maybe it was. I mean, they would have put it in the screenplay if it didn't resonate with something, but wow, that yeah. moment took me out of it, too. It's just like, I got it from that health food place, and that that felt very 80s. Like, that, it's so right? silly, yeah. That's the thing. It's like, the, the moment when we were like, whoa, they eat wacky food in other cultures. Like, that's, that's talking about sushi in the 70s. That's talking about, like, you know, I guess you say health food in the 80s. That's not talking about hummus in 2005, in my memory, yeah. maybe I'm totally off base. I feel like I've been eating hummus for more than 17 years, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I I don't know. That's a mystery, and that that's not something I can speak to either, but it was very fascinating to me. Um. Anyway, uh, is there anything else that you want to bring up that we haven't really covered yet? Absolutely, because um, we have so far done an excellent job of not talking about this as a horror film, and I think we should, uh, uh-huh. we should, we should dive into that. And I want to actually use the 9-11 talk to springboard off of that. Um, the conversation at the time, there were probably two big points of conversation, both of which are kind of dead now uh, when the film came out. This is why it's great to return to films. One, of course, was, boy, Tom Cruise, that deranged lunatic Scientologist who's jumping on couches and uh-huh. trying to make Brooke Shields be depressed, like, or Brooke Shields? Brooke Shields. Um that was like all over this film's critical reception it was like Tom Cruise has lost his goddamned mind. And it, mm. it didn't, he's still the same person. He's still a Scientologist. He probably still has the same thoughts about postpartum depression. But now that he has decided his thing is going to be to stage his own death in front of a camera for our amusement. I think we've all sort of forgiven him. <laughs> and I love the Mission Impossibles. I'm willing to forgive a lot of bad shit for the man who gives me the Mission Impossibles. So, like, that's where I'm at. But um, that was one of the things people talked about, and that's just been forgotten. Like, who even remembers that he was married to Katie Holmes now, you know? But uh, the other one is, this was the first film, the first, like, pop movie to bring in 9-11 imagery. And, and we sort of touched on that. And, uh, at the time people were talking about it, it was like, okay, so now we've crossed this threshold. Now we can start bringing in 9-11 imagery. And I mostly don't think it happened. I think that um, 9-11 as a, like, touchstone for filmmakers never really became a thing. 
but it's certainly going on in this film. You know, we've touched on like 9-11 as a narrative element, but also as a visual element. But um, that was kind of the thing. In 2005, this was seen as a movie about 9-11. And watching it all these years later, so removed from 9-11, um, I mean, you kind of touched, pointed towards this talking about, you know, for you, it's more about the um, the family drama. For me, the film is just this constant escalator towards ever more grueling horror imagery and the 9-11 stuff comes in fairly early so part of part of my experience of this film is that he's using 9-11 as a a single example of a much broader sort of trick of using different ways that we sort of view existential horror like in 2005 the fear of terrorism was right there so he's going to pull a 9-11 but I think there's just this constant movement upwards and upwards and upwards until we get to and this is why i'm saying that the last act of the movie works very well for me uh the landscape covered in blood vines yeah terraform for want of a better it's disgusting it's like yeah they're, they're terraforming it that's never really made clear it just kind of is what's happening but they're they're grinding human bodies into a blood mist that then just coats the world in this like horrible looking red vine and it's at, at the time I think in, in I've never really written about this film sadly I think I, I gave this a little poke in my um my best of 2005 list the first top ten I ever did as a blogger I think I used the word Boschian you know Hieronymus mm-hmm. Bosch's like visions of hell and I stand by that I think like what the film is building up towards through all of this like you know 9/11 imagery and and plane destroying a suburban home imagery and all these things that are like sort of horrifying feelings that sort of hit us where we live it's building up to just like this grotesque over the top grotesque garish portrayal of like literal hell on earth and Mm -hmm. to me that's a great climax for this film like I, i love that sequence of just like seeing these giant cgi tripods which hold up very well i think the cgi holds up extraordinarily well the, years old. the aliens themselves less so but they're in less like 20 so. seconds they're they're not a thing that we really care about nearly as much but no the tripods look so great um so these these just like unfathomably big landscapes with these huge tripods themselves reduced to fairly small elements in the composition as we're just looking at like this scope of just destruction and horror and and i love that that's like my favorite thing this movie does no, that that's actually that's a really good point because the movie does it, it it takes a breath but not not in a way that reduces the character's fate. Mm-hmm. Um it's like they are no longer in immediate danger. They are they they live amongst the danger. Just the mm-hmm. everything is danger now. Right. Um and everything has been so thoroughly destroyed that they specifically don't matter enough to destroy anymore. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. That's the and, way of putting it. And that is really grim. Um, and, and I didn't mean to discount this. I guess by third act, I really meant the last ten minutes. Um, That's fair. But, That's fair. but yeah, no, the, the, this part is tremendously effective at just the mind-gnawing horror. Yeah, that is, it, it is an extremely effective horror landscape. And, and I think part of the reason why the last ten minutes kind of fall a little flat we get that before we get Tom Cruise in that like human cage throwing grenades up into the like pulsating anus of the yeah the alien ship. Um, I could make a terrible joke about Tom Cruise shoving things in anuses, but I, I won't because I'm a classy man. You're so um, classy. <laughs> Whenever anyone asks me about Tim, I'm like classy as hell. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. I I, I try to live my life. As a man of, of elegant <laughs> letters. Uh, but no, I think part of where, where the sort of fizzling out that does happen, I agree, in the last 10 minutes, is that we've seen this image and it feels like there's nowhere left to escalate. So now it's just, okay, now we have to wrap this up as a, an action sci-fi movie. Um, yeah, and, and that whole scene where they're, they're in the tunnel and the tripod is crushing the jail, that's just, it's nothing. It's just nothing. It's, it, it was, it's an anticlimax. Like, the yeah. climax of the film is the first big landscape shot. And mm-hmm. after that, it's all kind of just tidying things up, wrapping up. Uh, so no, I get that. I get that for sure. It, it's, it's weakest material is all in the last 10 minutes. Speaking of, I was going to say, do we, do we want to talk about the last scene? 
Yeah, the last scene. Last scene. Um, Where, (laughs) you know, it's the family reunion scene. And obviously we know that this movie, like from the start, you know, this movie is going to end with him and Dakota fanning. Like, you know, he will have saved her. He will have redeemed himself. That was Mm -hmm. kind of always what was going to happen. But of course, so suddenly Miranda Otto and her husband and her parents, they're just in a brownstone. Like apparently nothing has touched them in Boston. Yeah, apparently the aliens were like, eh, Boston, not worth it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, they saw they saw Casey Affleck walking around being sad, and they're like, "Ugh, boring." <laughs> um, but yeah, but then also uh, Robbie is there miraculously. He has somehow survived what is as explicit as can be, just napalm. Right? <laughs> yeah. He's got I, a couple so, cuts on his cheek, though. So here is my my theoretical question for you. Is the ending okay if Robbie's not there? Is it already bad, or is he what makes it bad? Because he clearly makes it worse. I think I would be able to swallow it if Robbie was not there. I think I'd be able to swallow it more. I still feel the very particular shot of of Miranda Otto's parents oh, yeah. wandering out of the brownstone... That is a shot that you needed to set up those characters in advance. Like, we get who they are from context. We understand how households work. But, like, they're just sort of, now they're characters. Now we get their reaction shot, and we see Tom Cruise's reaction shot towards them. And it's like, these are these are extras. Mm-hmm. They don't talk. We, we don't know their names. We know nothing about these people. And, like, and having that be part of the emotional climax is... So weird. So I, I think I, I'm already not on board with it because of mm. those two characters. But man, bringing Robbie back was just a dumb decision. Absolutely. It's, it's irredeemable. I, I will say, I'm not saying that this was a good decision, but I think this is where they thought it was the best thing to do. Though The actors playing the grandparents are the leads of the 1950s War of the Worlds movie. Oh, well, that's cute. Yeah, they, it's, there were there was a whole movie that they could have plugged those people in. Yes, like they could have plugged them in as <laughs> unless like, the idea is that it's in continuity and this is the second time this has happened. Oh dear lord! <laughs> um, th- yeah, they, all these ships have been buried in the earth for a million years, minus fifty. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, they could have had the grandparents at any point, and they could have died off screen, and we wouldn't have to deal with them. Um, right. But yeah, so or, I, or even even like have him call and he gets the grandparents and like yeah. the grandmother says something snitty to him because that's clearly like we get a little line earlier in the film about like tell your mom I said hi mm. or whatever and, and it's like oh you're an asshole. Uh, mm. So like even if we'd gotten like that sort of little bit like it, establishing them as on screen presences in any capacity prior to the shot I think would have would have made it a little softer for me. Yeah, well, it, but it is just also the thing of like. The, the you know, the family reunion thing was, you know, uh, again, kind of an inevitability to some degree. Mm-hmm. But the idea that they are in a perfectly preserved upper class house, every member of the family except for him and the kids is, seems unscathed, untouched by this global catastrophe. <laughs> um, it just, it feels very strange. No, it it is, it is weird. And that's that's kind of why I framed it, like, Obviously, what pushes this from no to absolutely fucking not is Robbie. But like, I I still don't think the ending does what it needs to do, and and that's you know, Spielberg in the twenty first century. He's uh he's 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 not really been very good at getting movies landed, you know. Yeah, and I mean the, the movie is so excellent for so much of the time that right. you can forgive the 10 minutes and, where it's just and kind it's of a sh- farting. And it's a short, little, tiny, the really objectionable part yeah, of yeah. it is just such a short part of it. Like, I would think of something like uh, Minority Report, which doesn't have anything, I don't know, actually, I was going to say, it doesn't have anything as bad as Robbie coming back, but it, it does one thing that I think is oh, no. bad. I'm not going to say it, because we're not spoiling Minority Report, but uh, uh-huh. it does a thing that I don't like at all. <laughs> But um, Minority Report is not great for quite a long time, for like 20 full minutes of screen time. Mm-hmm. So so is this worse or better than Minority Report in that sense? I mean, I can't say. I can tell you that Robbie really fucking blows. 
in the ending of this movie. Yeah, but you know, that that really, really objectionable part is 1% or less of the movie, essentially. Exactly, exactly. Although so, I, I, I do want to ask you a... a were you going to ask me no, a question? No, nope, no, go for it. I want to just ask you, and if you don't have an answer, you know, that's fine. Is this Spielberg's worst ending? Oh, um... Mm, maybe. <laughs> um, do you it's got to it be in the conversation. I don't be. know if I think it's his worst ending of 2005. I oh, so Munich has a worst ending, you're saying? Really, really, really. Have you seen Munich? If I say something about the end of Munich, will that be a spoiler for you? Um, I have not seen it, but I don't particularly mind. Uh, those in the know will know what I'm talking about. Those not won't be spoiled here. I think the sex scene in Munich is quite possibly the worst scene Spielberg has ever directed. Okay. And the sex scene is is within the last five minutes of Munich. Okay. See, I'm I'm trying to remember, like, you know, literally what is the ending of the, you know, the movies that I've seen. Like, what are the last scene of any Spielberg movie? And I'm not I'm not drawing anything worse. Well, so so the post basically insert ends with a sequel hook for all the president's men. Okay, yeah, that's it pretty ends, bad. And ends with a little like ha 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 about um about Watergate. Lincoln ends with Lincoln going off to the theater. That's and a then pretty we bad get ending. Sort of like gold and dissolve to him like reading a speech. That's a uh, bad ending. Minority Report just flat out has a, an act where it's like the movie's over, but we decided we wanted to give you twenty more minutes of just mm. shitting the bed. Um. Those are probably the most notorious offenders. I actually will defend the end of AI, which I know a lot of people would wrap into the Spielberg mm. can't end his movies. Um, and then there's exceptions. I think Bridge of Spies, final shot, really well chosen final shot. So mm-hmm. so there, he, he, he can end a movie. He just frequently chooses not to. Yeah, that's fair. Whatever. Um, I, can't, I can't remember any movies ever at this point. You know, All like right. when, when you're forced, like if you're playing a trivia game, you're like, do I know anything? <laughs> Um, not you. You know everything. I know. Um, I'm very smart. I'm very good at trivia. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, that's going to be it from me on this movie. Is there anything else you want to add before we get out? We've been talking for like 18 hours. I No, I, I feel like I had my piece to say and I said it. I, I will say just to, to formally declare, because I know I said I love this movie, but I want to just emphasize I really, really love this movie. This to me is a top 10 Spielberg film. I don't know if I mean top ten is pretty pretty. It's a wide berth, so it might be in my top ten. I really do like this movie, but it's 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 like a a minus tier for me. I mean, I have it at a minus, but I have a minus comfortably within my Spielberg top ten. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, what would be in my top ten? I mean, uh, Jurassic Park, obviously. Um, See, I here's here's my hot take. I think this is a much better film than Jurassic Park. Really? I do. Okay. I love Jurassic Park. Um, I I like it a lot. I don't love it. Okay. That's okay. And, and I will say a big part of what, what the tiebreaker between that film and this film, this film has a way better child actor. Oh, it does. Yeah, way Lexi and Tim better. are, you know, that's just not, that's not even fair. Um, but yeah, no, this would be in my top ten. I mean, it's like what, The Color Purple I like, um, Jaws, Duel, it, it, War of the Worlds can live in there. Okay. Anyway, uh, that that's that on that. Um, for next time, in two weeks from now, we are going to be discussing another skeleton in the closet of an Oscar nominee. And this one's much more of a skeleton. It's, it's much more skeletal and, and much likelier that you remember it even than this semi-forgotten Spielberg film. Yeah, which is very peculiar. It came out two years after this one. Um, it's 2007's The Messengers, starring a pre-Twilight, pr- very pre-Spencer, Kristen Stewart. Yep. Um, but yeah, so we'll catch you next time for that. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and you know, have 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 a great time. Have a nice day. On thanks, me. everybody. <laughs> Bye. Ah! She hates me.